got 7 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, thank you for being here. It's good to see you. I know our numbers are still a little bit down. It's still a nice crowd for Wednesday night, but uh, uh, still a little down. We still have some people that are struggling with either being quarantined or either being quarantined, being sick and getting over it, or just right now I'm going to take a little break and make sure this stuff, this this uh, whatever phase we're in right now, kind of let it get out of here and then I'll pop back. So I know we're in that and it's been going up and down. It's hard to, you know... When people are not here, I don't know why they're not here, if they're sick or if they're quarantined for some reason or if they're out of town. I, I don't have a clue anymore. It's hard to, it's hard to, to know those things. I just trust, I trust that, hey, if you're supposed to be here, you're here. And that's, that's between you and God right now because I can't do anything else about it. So, uh, but anyway, it's good to have you here. I'm thankful that you're here. I got just a couple announcements to, uh, to, to give to you tonight. Um, uh, the National Association of Real Baptists is planning on meeting this, this summer in Memphis, and they are looking to try and see about competition with the kids and the young people that we usually take. And so uh, this would be the, probably the last time I, I announce this. Brother Daniel does have a slide about it. But um, if you have a young person or know of a young person that, that wants to compete in, in the competition in grades 1 through 12, uh, please see Brother Daniel so he can kind of determine how we want to proceed and how we want to do this. And uh, there's still, there's a lot of questions about that even throughout the state. Uh, last time I talked to Daniel, he knew of three churches that were even thinking about it. And we were one of those three. So there's a lot of churches that are just, you know, hey, we're just not going to do it this year. Um, so we'll just see what happens. And, and so he's looking at seeing if there's anybody interested in doing those things. Also next Monday, uh, for the teenagers, uh, Brother Daniel is going to have a trip to Raleigh and they're going to go to... Uh, a mall and they're going to kind of do a little bit of shopping and get lunch and then come back and just kind of do something together. This will be the first really big outing or anything. It's really not that big of a thing, but this first big outing that they have done since February. And so he just wanted to do something small, get started, try and do something with the teens and, and keep them excited and happy and going. And so that's what they're doing. And so that's on Monday from nine to five uh, and he's just saying bring money for shopping and money for lunch. And they'll have a good time looking forward to that. Um, I'm glad that he's going and not me anymore. I, I enjoy those things, but, you know, I'm getting to a point that I'm thankful to have a youth pastor. Um, also, we're still doing our mass for everyone, 10 years old and older. Uh, if you've been sick or if you've been around people or something, you know, it sounds horrible, and I hate to keep saying it, but I say it. It seems like I've said this every Sunday, Wednesday since... June, but you know if if you're sick, not feeling well, watch it at home. And, and, and most of our people, I think, you're doing that uh, as far as I know, anyway. Uh, but we just uh, we're trying to keep uh, our church facilities as as healthy as possible. Uh, we're still collecting our offerings out in the wooden boxes out there, and uh, so there's a lot of things going. This Sunday, we'll be having church. Looking forward to having church. It's good to have Brother Bobby with us um, finally. <laughs> uh, he uh, Sunday the third was supposed to be his uh, first Sunday, and we were, uh, we were shut down. And so if you watched it online, uh, he led the music, but, it, you know, it, again, it was online, and so it was watching there. And then the next Sunday, he's quarantined, uh, and so he has been sick, and now he's gotten over all that, and he's back ready to go, and so he is here tonight, and I'm excited to have him. We had a good time yesterday uh, just kind of going through a lot of stuff around church and, and things and then uh, today, just getting ready for tonight and some other things that we've been doing. And so it's good to have him here. And so I've, I don't know how long this is going to last because uh, um, I have some other jobs for him later as we go along in this year. Uh, maybe on Wednesday nights that he's going to be doing. But tonight I said, hey, why don't you lead the song tonight? So he is going to come up and he is going to lead our song tonight, which I am so thankful for. But, uh, and I, you, I know you're probably thankful for it too. But um, but I've asked him to come do that. So, uh, Brother Bobby, you come up here and lead us in a song. As we are uh, going to be looking at Revelation tonight, um, as we've been doing on Wednesdays, I thought it appropriate to sing a song that will kind of take us on a spiritual field trip, if you will, uh, to that day the day that whenever we're going to see Jesus. And so I'd like to open with just a quick scripture real quick out of Revelation 21. 
and then we'll get to sing, and the Bible says, just four verses, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And God is true and faithful about that promise. And that day is going to come one day, folks. We're actually going to see him. We're going to see God. It's written down. We're going to see him. And what a day that will be. Let's all stand together and sing that song with all our hearts to the Lord. What a wonderful day that will be when we see our Jesus. Amen. There's coming a day. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness or pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. And what a day! glorious day that will be. Sing it out to the Lord. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen, church. Thank you so much for singing. You may be seated. These masks and these microphones don't mix together very well. A um, couple prayer requests, uh, just uh, normal things. I don't have a lot of uh, new things, uh, but just remember our unspoken requests that we have. Um, unsaved family members, loved ones. Don't forget that uh, this year, um, I'm, I, the challenge is each one reach one. And so I would really love to see us reaching uh, these lost people that we know, especially the ones that we know and reaching them for Jesus, and so that's my challenge for you guys this year. Also, pray for those who are sick. We have several people that are still recovering uh, from getting over things. I mentioned Amanda Leggett the other night. Uh, she is doing much better, so that's good. I'm glad when you get that pneumonia or possibility of getting pneumonia, the beginning stages of it, there's you know like two directions you can go. You can either go down or you can go up, and, and I'm thankful that she's going up and doing much better, so uh, we're thankful for that. 
Um, also pray for our students, uh, kids that uh, in college and in, in school age kids and our teachers as they're trying to go through this time. Um, my understanding is Beaufort County is doing the same system that they had um, in the first semester, so I'm hoping that that will go well and they'll continue to be all right. Pray for these two girls over here. Uh, Sydney will be leaving tomorrow, headed back to Tennessee, and Adriana will be leaving on Friday, headed back up to Virginia uh, to college, and so pray for them as they travel and as they start their new semester, and so uh, uh, pray for them as they go through that. Also, our healthcare workers, we have several that are working in the healthcare system, pray for them. Uh, it just can be very overwhelming for them, I'm sure, uh, just talking to uh, people, uh, not just nurses, but just talking to people who answer the phones. Uh, I know it's crazy and hectic for everybody right now, and so just... Uh, Remember them as they go through this time. And then again, we mentioned Sunday, but remember our country. A lot of stuff that's happening right now around us. A lot of things are going on. So remember to pray for our country. So let's uh, pray and we will ask uh, God just to be in our, our class tonight. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for what you do for us every day. God, I pray that you will uh, be with these requests that have been mentioned tonight, Lord. Um, God, I pray for those in our church family and those that we may know that that are sick right now, Lord, whatever the sickness is. But God, I pray that you'll bring healing to them, that you'll continue to bless, bless them uh, with that. God, I'm thankful that Amanda is doing much better. I pray that she'll continue to, to do that. And so, Lord, just uh, bless her. Thank you uh, that uh, people are getting over these things that we know of, God, because I know of so many other places and people that are just having a really bad and rough time. And so, God, we're thankful, uh, and we don't want to overlook the blessings that you have given to us. God, I pray for our health care workers that are um, just, God, they're working really hard right now, and they're, they're struggling sometimes with, with everything that's going on. And so, God, I pray for them. Give them the uh, peace that they need. God, I pray for our teachers, our students, uh, as they start this new semester. Lord, I pray that things will go well, that they'll have a good semester. God, I, I, I pray for Sydney, Adriana, as they travel back to uh, their colleges. Lord, I pray that you'll give them safety as they travel and be with them through the semester. God, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. God, be with our country. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks, but God, you do. So God, help for us to not uh, walk around with worry, but God, to walk around knowing that you're in control. So God, we just give that to you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I want to start off with <laughs> the bad joke of the day because this is a uh, few people's favorite times. And... Uh, there's some people that get up and leave after I do this. Um, I'm just kidding. You guys are going to look around and see who that is, but it's not. Uh, but I like this one. I thought it was kind of funny, and I got that weird sense of humor because I was a youth pastor for 17 years. But uh, what's the best way to watch a fly fishing tournament? Dennis, you know? I figured Dennis would know because he's a Mr. Fisherman. So, uh, But the best way to watch a fly fishing tournament is live stream. I knew Dennis would like it. Uh, if you need that, if you need that later, I'll write it down for you. All right. But uh, anyway, tonight we're going to go back into our study on the Book of Revelation, and uh, I've really enjoyed this. You know, people say, "Well, how long is this going to go?" Oh, well, there's 22 chapters, and we're going to go to the end, and so we'll see what happens. And I don't know how long that's going to take, um, but that is the plan for that. But tonight we're going to be starting to look at Revelation chapter eight. Uh, if you want to look in your Bibles at that, I will have stuff up on the screen tonight. But if you want to look at Revelation chapter 8 and make any notes, you can. But in Revelation chapter 6, uh, when we last looked at Revelation chapter 6, chapter 6 described the opening of the first four seals. And so we were talking about the first four seals of judgment in chapter 6. And then there's four, first four seals, and it seems like it's been forever ago. I think it was right before, actually right before Thanksgiving, the last time we, we looked at chapter 6 anyway. And so with that chapter 6, it was the first four seals. Uh, they were looking at the white horse, and we talked about the white horse of judgment that was coming in. Uh, he was a conqueror. Uh, he was a guy that had the bow, but he had no arrows on it. He, he was coming in to conquer, but he was going to use peace to do it, and it was kind of a weird thing. We talked about that. A lot of people... Um, 
refer to the Antichrist as being that, that one of those persons that's going to come in and he's going to conquer by proclaiming peace, but he's going to be after people with a bow. And so you have to be careful with that. We also looked at the red horse. The red horse was going in to take away peace from people. It talked about how uh, men would be killing other men. It was just going to be no peace on earth. And he was coming in with a sword. And then we also looked at the third and the fourth. The third was the black horse who was coming in uh, to the food supply. He was going to be affecting the food and all the things that people would be eating and how they would be able to purchase it. And he was carrying the scales. And so he had that, the scales that you weigh things with. And so he had that um, in his hand. And then we also looked at the pale horse, and it said that he who rode on him was death. And it was death by sword, by famine, by plague, by wild beasts. It was going to be an ugly time, and a lot of things were going to be happening, and death was coming in. And so we saw those uh, first four uh, um, judgments, the seals of judgment. And then the last two that we looked at here in, in five and six was the souls of the tribulation. When they opened the fifth seal, the souls of the tribulation saints, you remember, were under the altar of God. And he was, there, were, there was talking about how these saints were there. They were under God's protection. Things had gone through, things had happened. But it, I also re, kind of referred to like a, a mother hen with his feathers over his, his chicks. And they're underneath the altar of God. But then also uh, we look at when they opened the sixth, sixth seal, uh, there was earthquake. The sun turned black. The moon turned red. It was just what was going to be going on here? And there's a lot of different things that we looked at on that night when we, when we discussed that. And then when you got into chapter 7, which we looked at last week, it described this, the ceiling of the 144,000. And we talked about how those were Jewish people that were going to be following Christ, following God, and they were going to choose those, they are going to be sealed, and they are going to be great witnesses that were going to go out uh, to the world to do that. But neither chapter 6 or chapter 7 mentioned the seventh seal. They went through the first six, and then it talked about the 144,000, and we never got to the, uh, the last one. And so what we're going to look at, we finally get into chapter 8, and in chapter 8 we see a pattern that is starting to begin with these seals. The pattern was in the first one, the seven seals were broken into two different sets of seals. We had the four horsemen that we talked about and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They do all these different things. And then there was three additional judgments that were thrown onto the earth. We're going to see that third one tonight, that last one for for that seal. But then we're getting into the seven trumpet judgments. And in the seven trumpet judgments, the pattern again is, is they're broken into two different sets. There's four judgments that we're going to be looking at tonight. And then there are the three woes. And that will be something that we'll be looking at next week. And so we're looking at this pattern of how they're they're, they're putting them together. So if we look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, that's where we're beginning at tonight. It says this, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So think about that for a second. Think about where we last left everything going together last week at the end of chapter 7. And this last seal, it was the last seal that was holding this scroll together. The seals, if you know, is like wax, and it was holding these seals together. You open the first one, you open the first page, and the second one to get to the second page, and now you've got to the last one, and they opened the last seal. It was the last thing that was holding these things together. There was nothing else to remain to keep the judgments from coming about and happening. It's now been opened, everything. The seals have been opened. Nothing else is going to prevent them from happening. They went... From last week when we were ending chapter 7, they went from this glorious worship service in heaven. All the people were gathered around the throne of God, all coming from different directions and different areas of different types of people. They're all there around the throne of God in chapter 7. And then all of a sudden, as they open up the seventh seal, it was silent. Silence for half an hour as we open up chapter 8. The flashes of lightning... The rumblings, the thunder, all those things that were happening around the throne of God. They were quiet. They were not going on anymore. The four creatures that were flying around, the 24 elders that represented the church, all of them became silent. 
the great heavenly host of angels, the tribulation saints that were all there in front of the throne of God, they all began to cease their praise. So you have to picture that. Things are going great, awesome, wow. And all of a sudden, he opens that last one, everybody's, and it wasn't just a, for half an hour, like 30 minutes, nothing going on. Silence. The anticipation. Because now all of a sudden people are realizing, ooh, something's about to happen. Don't know what it is right now. It's almost like the air was taken out. The seventh seal has been opened. So then we look at chapter, or we look at verse 2. He says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. So now we see a different stage is, is set here that we haven't been uh, privy to seeing before. The tribulation period is in the Bible, throughout the Bible, is given many different names. But I want you to see something. The last name that the prophet Zephaniah gives is very significant to what's happening now in the book of Revelation while John is having this vision of heaven. And so in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14, 15, and 16, in Zephaniah it says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities, against the corner towers. He's saying this is going to be a bad day, Zephaniah is saying. The trumpet will sound, the battle cry is there. And it's funny, I, I, I watch every once in a while, my father-in-law loves them, my dad loves them, but all these old, they call them the cowboy shows. And a lot of them is John Wayne or, or other, other TV shows, and they'll, you know, they'll be out there and it's that they sound the trumpet to charge, but they also sound the trumpet to come back. They also sound the trumpet when it's time for lunch. The trumpet is there to sound the alarm, the charge. And here it is, we're talking about in, in Revelation, the, the trumpet that's going to be out there. And out of all the angels in heaven, it says that only seven specific angels are the ones that constantly stand in the very presence of God. And they're known as the archangels. These seven angels are constantly they're right there around God's throne. And they're the archangels. And their names remain a mystery except for, for two Michael and Gabriel. But there's actually five other ones. We just don't know their names. But Michael is, is mentioned in the book of Daniel. Daniel is, is, is getting a vision from God, and Michael comes in, and he's talking to Daniel, and he's telling him about these things that are going to happen. And then we see Gabriel is mentioned in Luke. He's the one that comes and, and, and talks to uh, Mary, Joseph, about, hey, you're fixing to have this baby, and this is going to be the Messiah that's coming. See, these, these angels, these archangels, they bring announcements. Something's happening. Something's about to come. And now they're standing around the throne of heaven, these seven angels. They've been given trumpets to announce something's fixing to happen. Something's fixing to go down. These angels... They make announcements of great significance, and each will be handed a trumpet for the battle cry that is to come. Look at verse 3. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. So now we've been entered. We, we see the seven angels, the archangels that are standing around the throne. They've been given the trumpets. And then another angel, this eighth angel who is not identified. And it's interesting as you read and read about this, there are some experts that believe that it could be Jesus. But a majority of other scholars believe that it's just another very powerful angel because Jesus has another job that he's doing right then. So this is another angel that many people believe that is coming in here. It's a powerful angel that's coming in here, and he has this... Sensor. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you a little bit of that so you can kind of understand what, what we're talking about here. But he, he holds this special position of service and he stands before the golden altar of God. 
So he's standing before the altar. The altar is there. He goes before the altar of God, and he's got this censer thing. This golden censer was like the ones that was used in the Old Testament temple. It contained charcoal that was burned underneath a layer of incense that brought off smell. Frankincense that was taken to Jesus was, was, uh, was um, a type of incense that, was, that smells. And so some people believe that even this stuff that he has there that he's swinging in, in heaven could even be frankincense. They don't know for sure what that is. But the fragrance that, that is there, and this is what it would look like similar. You know, I don't know what it looks like in heaven, but this is what it would look like here. Uh, this fragrance reminds God that his son came and died for the sins of the world. The smell that's there, the things that are going on, the, the fragrance that is there representing his son. And this angel, this eighth angel, is standing before the altar of God, which is before the throne of God, and he has in his hand this censer that has this fragrance in it. And it says he was given a lot of it, a lot of fragrance, a lot of incense that was there. The eighth angel will come with a golden censer. He'll stand before the altar of God. He'll be given a great amount of, of incense to mix, it says, with the prayers of the saints. And then he will place the censer on the altar before the throne of God. So he has this prayers of the saints, this smell of fragrance that is there, and he places it on the altar, which is before the throne of God. So those things are going on. And we see... Something that is very important because he says he's mixed with the prayers of the saints. I want you to see, I, I wanted to throw this out there. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And these prayers have been set right before God. On this incense, this burning, the smell is coming, the fragrance of God. You hear, you hear pastors will say, you know, be a sweet smell to the nostrils of God. Well, this is where it comes from. And this is what we're talking about here. Look at verse 4. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Now, if you go back into verse 3, verse 3 told us that the eighth angel will be given the prayers of all the saints. And we may never know what all of these prayers of the saints are. But we do know one. We do know one because if we go back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. And remember in chapter 6, when, when things are going on, it says that these, these uh, the saints were underneath the altar of God. And it said, in verse 10, they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? The prayers of, the, of these tribulation saints going up to God. You remember the answer? And we're going to look at that in a little bit later. He said, just hold on a little bit. Not yet. We don't have everybody we need yet. Pretty much, that's Darren, that's Walker version, but that's, that's pretty much what was said. Judgment, we have to understand and we have to know, judgment is not God's first choice. Patience is. Sometimes we wonder today why God has not thrown judgment down on the earth yet. Why has God not thrown judgment? And he may, maybe he has thrown some types of judgment on the United States, but we're wondering, why, why is God just not coming and just destroyed us? Look at what's going on. Look at what's happening in our country. Look at what's happening in our world. All this sin. All this, we're worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. If God doesn't, I've heard people say, if God doesn't punish the United States, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Have you heard that before? But see, you have to understand, judgment is not God's first choice. God is a patient God. You and me, we're not that patient. We're not patient at all. God is more patient than any of us. But here's the thing. When all options fail, his judgment is going to fall. It's coming. He's weighing out everything. He's looking at all options, every corner, everything to do. We, we don't do that all the time. We jump and we go after it and we, we get mad and we just start smacking. God is going to look at every avenue he can. 
very patient, making sure that everybody that's coming is coming. We're not going to leave anybody behind. We're going to be as patient as we can. But as I was thinking about this, uh, this censor that, that this angel had, this eighth angel, I know this is a picture of the Pope, and I'm not Catholic. But in his hand, basically, is a censer, and he's, 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 he's swinging that out with the incense that's there. Now, I've never seen the Pope do it, but I was in Bulgaria several years ago, and we, we always, before we leave, we always, we, our last night is in, in Sofia, which is the capital of Bulgaria, and there's this big church, Bulgarian Orthodox church that is in uh, Sofia, and we usually go and we see it from a distance, or we drive by it, but several years ago, we'd get there a little earlier, and so we would go, we, we actually got to go inside of it, and I remember being in there one day, and just so happens to be the time on this, uh, I think it was on a Sunday, that the priest, the Bulgarian priest, the Orthodox priest, was going to come out to do his thing. And you could tell because more people had kind of come into the church. We were just in there looking around at the church and seeing it. But now more people had come in off the street. Not a lot, but there were people that had come in. And all of a sudden, as we're standing there from, you know, almost like from the door back here, the priest comes out. And he's got one of those incensors, and he's swinging. The smoke's coming off, and you can smell the, the sweet fragrance of the incense that's burning on this thing. And he's going around. He's going to the different people that have come in there. And when he would go to someone, they would fall on their knees, and they almost bowing before this priest, and they would pray, and they'd do their thing, and the priest would say some, I don't know what he's saying because he's in Bulgarian. He was saying some stuff, and he was swinging that smoke around. I was standing in the back trying to get, I was just observing he comes over to me, and I'm standing there like this. He comes over to me, and he starts swinging that thing. Everybody else had been, oh, and they got down, they're praying and doing it. And I'm just standing there. I'm not going to bow down to this guy. He's, he's not Jesus. He's not God. And he starts he's swinging that thing. He looks at me, and I just go. He moves over to the next person. But it was just, it was interesting to see because he, that's, that's the vision, not because it's a wrong Orthodox church and the Pope and all this stuff, but that's the vision that I see when I read this. This angel is standing there with, this, with the prayers, the incense, and he's before God, and the smell of the smoke is going up before God. That's where that comes from. That's where a lot of those things happen. This angel will take the censer containing the hot or yeah, the hot incense and the prayers of the saints. And he'll wave it around, causing the smoke to drift towards the throne of God. That's kind of the vision that I had when I was actually there seeing this guy do this stuff. Almighty God will smell the incense. He'll hear the prayers. And then he's going to prepare his answer. The answer is coming. <laughs> Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came uh, peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Very interesting when, you, when you're trying to visualize these things. He's going, and all the smells now have been burned up. All this, the, the prayers have been gone, gone up to God. All the incense and prayers have been consumed. The angel goes back, he fills it up, he goes back to the altar of God, he fills it up with the fire that's in the altar, and then he just basically, all I can see is almost like David with his sling, and he's like, wham, and throws it. Now, I don't know what it looks like, but that's what I get. And he throws it and hurls it at the earth. You see, the prayers go up, and the answers come down. We have that song, when prayers go up and the bless, I don't remember how that goes, blessings come down. I don't, I'm not, see, but you, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys do, and some of you guys are like, dude, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. But the prayers go up, the answers come down. God will avenge the death of the tribulation saints with fiery trials on the earth. The trumpets are about to sound. The seals have all been opened. Now I want you to visualize this scene that we're talking about, this stuff that's going on, and I want you just to work in your mind with me, because I, I did this this afternoon, and it was just like, man, when you kind of throw it all together and mix it here together, I want you to see this. The Antichrist and the false prophet 
are rising to power. This is after the rapture. The Antichrist and the false prophet are beginning to rise to power. They will lead the people of earth to begin to worship Satan. So people are following this, this guy that says, hey, this is what you need to do. This is who you need to worship. The false prophet is there saying this is what needs to go on. And people are following that. God's people, on the other hand, are now being hunted down. They're being persecuted and they're being killed. The tribulation saints that are now going up to heaven that are underneath the altar. These martyred saints will arrive in heaven praying to be avenged. God, avenge us. What has happened for us and what we stood for you, avenge us, God. And then first, as I mentioned a while ago, they'll be told, hey, wait until the number of saved people increases. Give, give us some time. But after a brief time of waiting, God will respond to their prayers by having his angel hurl the burning censer to the earth. Boom, it's thrown at the earth. It will be followed by loud claps of thunder, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. God's wrath is now going to be felt by the entire earth. No one's going to be able to escape it. It's not that it's landing in the United States and Russia doesn't have a clue what's going on. It's not that it landed in Russia and the United States doesn't have a clue. The whole earth is going to know what just happened. They're going to feel it. Chapter 6, or verse 6. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. All this stuff has happened. And now they pull up their, their trumpets getting ready to blow. Once the burning censer has hit the earth, the archangels prepare to sound their trumpets, to sound the alarm, and I might say sound the charge. God's wrath is going to be unleashed in this next set of judgments. We've now opened the seven seals, and now we're starting into the seven trumpets. So we look at verse 7. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail, and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down from the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Think about that for a minute. This popped into my head today. This is in Montana. This popped into my head. Trees, mountains, green grass, beautiful scenery. Can you imagine that just being gone? not there anymore there are some bible experts who will not accept this verse as a literal event but prophecy experts believe without a doubt that this will happen that when the blows the first trumpet that a third of all these things are going to be destroyed now think about this for a minute Why do they think that this will definitely happen literally like this? Because in Exodus, we see a plague of hail that's mixed with fire that comes down and destroys crops, destroys animals, destroys all of these things that are out in the field. In in Genesis, we see the hail and the fire and the brimstone that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed that area, completely destroyed it. There's no reason to believe that God will not do this again. And so these, these scholars that are much smarter than I, they believe this is literal. These things are going to happen like this. The results of hail and fire and blood being hurled down upon one-third of the earth. You have to think about what, what could happen. There's going to be an immediate and an indescribable destruction that's going to happen. I mean Destruction. That we, we, we can't even picture in our heads. Destruction that's going on. But because of this destruction that's happening with what we just read, grass is going to be gone, trees, half the trees are going to be gone, all these things are going to be messed up and, and, and burned away. There's other consequences that come, come from that because here's the thing, much of the lumber to build is now going to be gone. They're not going to be able to build homes and build things because there's no trees, no lumber to build with. And then if you think about that, much of the grain that's needed for food is now going to be gone because all the grass has just been burned up now. 
So we have food that's gone. Building supplies is going to be gone. Because of the wood and the trees that are gone, because of the grass that is gone, there's going to be erosion that's going to be happening. There's going to be flooding that's going to take place. Mudslides are going to happen because there's not things that are holding the mud back. There's going to be air pollution because we don't have the whatever it's called, which I should have looked up, but we don't have the stuff where the the trees and the leaves are cleaning our air for us. You guys know that better than I do. So there's going to be air pollution. All these things are going on. Our entire ecosystem on the earth is going to be thrown out of balance. It's not going to be going the way that it's supposed to be going. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Um, in, in, uh, this is a picture of Jupiter versus the earth. Jupiter's a pretty big place. The earth is not compared to Jupiter. But I want you to, 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 to see something that I, I looked up and, and was reading about today. It's very interesting. Some of you guys may study this stuff and know this a whole lot more than I do. I just read about it. But in 1994, Comet called Shoemaker Levy 9 that they were following with the Hubble telescope across the sky broke into several fragments. And these several fragments began to collide with Jupiter. If you go on YouTube, you can actually watch some of that happening. This created, when, the, when these, with parts, pieces of this comet hit Jupiter. Jupiter. When pieces of this comet hit Jupiter, it created explosions, large, large dark clouds, ripples that you see in movies, ripples across the planet that were visible even through a small telescope that people had and were just looking up at the planet. One comet that broke into pieces that went and caused some major stuff on the planet. This right here is a, pl- is a picture of Jupiter and these, uh, these spots down here were part of the explosions and part of the darkened spaces that are now on the planet of Jupiter because of this comet that hit one comet. If one comet can go and hit Jupiter and cause this much damage and people can see it from the earth and all this stuff, can God not say, hey, you know what? I can destroy one-third of all these things on the earth. Verse 8 and 9, that's the first one. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. Verse 9, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So the, the first trumpet signaled judgment on the ground. Grass and trees, mountains, all these things were destroyed. The second trumpet signaled judgment on the sea, on the water that's out there, the oceans. This verse does not say that a burning mountain is going to be thrown into the sea. This verse says that something like a huge burning mountain, something like, John's looking at this and he doesn't know how to describe it. So he says, something like a huge mountain is thrown into the sea. And so he's describing it the best way he knows and the words that he knows. And he's talking about this and what's going on. Some people think that it could be a missile, nuclear missile coming in. And he sees it coming in. He doesn't know what it is, but it's hitting. Some people think that it could be like a burning comet, like what was hitting uh, Jupiter. But whether, whether, whatever it is, it will cause, it says, the sea to turn into blood, killing a third of all sea life and a third of all the ships. So a third of all animals in the ocean are dead now. Now can you imagine this thing? I don't think they just disappear. I think they have died and now they're floating on the top and there's probably some pretty raunchy smell that's coming from dead fish that doesn't smell good anyway. And a third of all the ships, now I I was looking and I, I just trying to find something. This is the port of Singapore. And in the port of Singapore, 
all these, uh, these ships come in here with all of the supplies that are on them. And these ships right here looking at the picture, they don't look super big, but they have like, man, I, I'm guessing now, four or five hundred more probably than that trucks. You know, the, the back, you know, semi-truck passes you on the highway and that trailer that they're pulling, that big old trailer on the back of a semi-truck, they have like five or six hundred of those on these ships, just the trailer part. And they're all over and they're going in and all these ships, can you imagine a third of them just gone, wiped out completely? The results of that, the people who depend on the sea for their job, for food, for defense for their islands or their countries or different places, transport that takes them back and forth or takes supplies back and forth, all of these things are now going to suffer because a third of everything is just gone. And then we go to verse 8 or 10 and 11, the third seal or the third trumpet. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. So now again, there are different, differing opinions about what this blazing star that comes in here and hits this stuff is. Some people think that this torch is like a, a meteor that's coming down again, another meteor that could hit the earth. Some people, again, are stuck on the, uh, the nuclear missile that, that's coming in and it hits this stuff, like a nuclear war that could happen. They, they, they will differ about these opinions, but all of these people will usually agree about what it will do. I don't know what it is, it's kitten, but I know what it's going to do. It says it contains some type of pollutant, some poisonous substance that's named after this bitter herb called wormwood. And so I looked up, I wanted to see what wormwood was, and so I'm looking it up. So this is wormwood, and it's a real herb that people use. It's, it's bitter in taste, but some people will use it for different things if you mix it with other stuff. People can use it for their stomachs, they can use it for other things around the world, different places, but... It's very bitter, and it can be bad, bad for you. It can be very poisonous. This wormwood, it contaminates, or whatever it is that, that's called, it's called wormwood, but it contaminates one-third of the world's fresh water supply, causing people to die from drinking tainted water. You always have to be careful. I, I don't know. Again, I'm going back to these cowboy western shows that, that mom or dad and and my father-in-law watch a lot. And sometimes, you know, you, they go and they're drinking out of the creek. You got to be careful where you drink from because if upstream something's coming down, you could get killed. You could die because the water's been polluted. And that's, again, the vision that I have, the vision that I get. They're drinking this, this water that's not good. Most people will be unable to obtain drinkable water before this extreme thirst starts to set in. So I started looking. Uh, and, and I was trying to look up these things. Depending on how much water they lose in to, due to physical activity, you know, how active you are, the temperature that it, it is outside, the humidity that it is, depending on where you're at, an adult can survive, it says, anywhere between three to seven days without water. And after that, you're basically going to die. You need your water. A sick person or an infant wouldn't last that long. So we have to remember this water now, a third of the water has been poisoned and it's, and it's bad and people are trying to get, they're getting thirsty. All this other stuff has been destroyed. All these other things are happening. I just want to get some water. I'm either drinking some poisonous water or I'm dying because the water has, is, or I can't drink the water and so I'm dying because I'm dying of thirst. In verse 12, the fourth angel the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. So we look at this, this fourth trumpet will affect the heavenly bodies up in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars. We have one that was the land, one that was the oceans, one was the fresh water, and now the fourth one is affecting the sun, moon, and stars, the light that's going on up in our sky. Now, again, depending on what was causing some of these things, it could be that the sun just dimmed. 
It could be that the earth is, is so much fire that's going on, the smoke is going up there and is blocking the light. It could be nuclear debris that has been hurled up into the atmosphere that's blocking the light as well. There's lots of people that write about that. If there's a nuclear war, it's called uh, nuclear snow. And this snow goes up in the sky and it blocks and doesn't let any light coming through. It's up in the atmosphere. So all of these things could be happening. And it's not said in Revelation how long this will last, this darkness. But a reduction of the earth's sunlight will affect the weather. It will affect the crops. It will affect all of life in general, all the things that are going on. I mean, right now, if you stand in the shade, it's cooler, right, than if you step out here and step into the sun. Right now, during the wintertime, I remember I was talking to somebody Sunday, and it was a little chilly, and we were standing outside, and I was in the shade because I was hot, because I'm always hot, it seems like. And they, was, they said, I'm going to step out here in the sunlight because they were getting warmed up. But in the summertime, don't we do the exact opposite? Man, you're standing in the sun, it's like, man, it's hot. So I just, man, you get in the shade. Sometimes it's 10, 15 degrees cooler in the shade than it is out there standing in the sun. But can you imagine the sun now is not bringing the heat down anymore? A third of it has been changed. It's darkened. Major winter storms could sweep across the earth, causing multitudes of people to freeze to death and die because the sun is not there giving off the heat. So we look at these things, and this is something that I thought was very interesting. Trumpet number one, hail, fire, and blood. The Exodus Egyptian plague that we read about in Exodus, hail and fire, it was directed at the false god Isis. Because that was the God of, of the things that were destroyed um, with, the, with the, the hail, fire, and blood. Trumpet number two, the sea turning to blood and the fish dying in Exodus and the Egyptian plague. Water to blood was directed at the false god, uh, I don't know how to say this correctly, Hyka. And so, again, a false god with his first one, a false god with his second one, if you're, looking at, if you're trying to compare these things. In trumpet three, the fresh water being poisoned goes back to the same thing uh, with Isis, with the water to blood. Um, If you go to trumpet number four, the sun, the moon, and the stars being struck. Today, we have astrologers, fortune tellers, witches who rely on heavenly bodies to predict the future. Pagan religions worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. And what do these four trumpets come in here and start destroying a third of everything? On these false pagan religions, false gods. The Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And people are throwing all this stuff out here. And then we get to verse 13. And John says, as, as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. <laughs> Dude, you thought it was bad. You thought it was rough. People are unsure <laughs> about who or what this eagle is. Is it the raptured church that's warning? Is it an angel that's warning? Or is it a literal eagle that's flying around? John says an eagle. Now, that, that's pretty interesting to see that, but I want you to see this in Numbers chapter 22, verse 28. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make, make you beat me these three times? If God can open the mouth of a donkey and talk to Balaam, God can sure enough open the mouth of an eagle as this eagle is flying, it says, whoa, whoa, whoa to you all. It's coming bad. These next three, these next three trumpets. This eagle that is, that is uh, introduced by John, this eagle will fly through the air, pronouncing three woes upon the inhabitants of the earth. Three woes that are coming. Now, some of them, some people call this the, uh, the trumpet woes. The trumpet woes. And it's hard to imagine, but these woes will be worse than any judgment that's already been mentioned. That's why the eagle comes through there and says, whoa, whoa to you. The next three that are coming, it's not going to be good. 
it's not going to be pretty. Now, I've been asking the last couple of times with, with these lessons in, in, in Revelation, do you take the word of God seriously? When we read these things, you take it seriously, oh man, that's a pretty cool story, I ought to make a movie about that. Or you take it, this is God's judgment on the earth because of the sin and the things that's going on, the things that are happening, it's all coming to an end. We'll be raptured, but here's the thing. I also challenged us this past Sunday, each one reach one. Why did I challenge each one to reach one? Because I don't want people to have to go through these things. How bad do you have to hate someone to wish this upon them? That's why I would like for all of us, the challenge is, hey, one person, the year of 2021, one person. Now, here, here's my underlying thing behind this, because I told you, it's not about numbers of the church. I'm not doing this about numbers. I'm not doing this about money. I'm doing this because I want people not to go to hell. But here's the underlying reason why I'm doing this behind this, is to say everybody reach one, because I really, I really believe if you reach one, you're going to get excited, and you're going to go reach two. And then when you've got two, you're going to go, dude, this is so awesome, and you're going to go get three. See, that's, that's where I'm at. I, I, I just want you, hey, I don't want people to go to hell. You shouldn't either. If we each one reach one, can you imagine how, what, what's going to happen? Because I don't, I don't believe, if you, if you really take this seriously and you actually try to reach one, I think you're going to reach more than one. So my challenge is find one. Find one. Next week, Revelation chapter 9, there's 21 verses. I doubt we make it through in one night. But we're going to jump into Revelation chapter 9 starting next week. Um, I, hope you, I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. I hope that you take the word of God seriously. This is some heavy stuff. Um, and I'm trying not to go super deep to blow your mind, but I'm trying not to stay up here on the top in the shallow end and not, not mean anything trying to find that happy medium somewhere where we're all, hey, this is real stuff. This is what the Word of God tells us as we study the book of Revelation. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for loving us. God, thank you of what you do for us. God, you've given us the warning. You've given us, the church, the, the saved people, the Christians, the, the believers, the followers of you. You've given us the book of Revelation You even said, blessed is he who reads the words that are written here. God, I, I, I believe we're going to be blessed by reading this because we're going to think, hey, I need to go and warn this person. I need to go and reach this person for Jesus so that they don't die and go to hell. God, I pray that we ourselves take it seriously, that we don't just go through the motions of Christianity, but that we take everything that we, we do seriously for you, how we live our life when we're away from here. God, help for us to glorify you in our lives and what we do. God, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. God, continue to be with those people who are sick, God, for our country as we're going through just the chaos of, of politics and elections, but God, also the, the chaos of COVID. God, be with churches that are, that are struggling. Be with Christians who are struggling. God, help us to not lose focus of, of who you are and what's important, but to continue to follow you in everything that we do. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you again for being here. I'm going to dismiss you again by sections. So I'm going to go ahead and let you six people over here go and you four people over here go. That's only ten, so you guys be all right.